sheet. That's when you have sheet rice. Okay. Oh. So I now know. Uh, uh, I know. I know. I know. I So it's really nice to be here. Thank you. Um, and I just want to note what an awesome advocate Lisa is, um, not only for you here, but everybody in your community. It's really special that you have this group. Um, so to with the falls issue, I think it's once every 11 seconds, um, someone over, over age 65 falls in the United States. Wow. Um, somebody's in, admitted to the ER every, I think, 11 minutes or 19 minutes for falling. Um, and, and what happens is once someone falls, you know, it leads to all these different things. I mean, how many people like to be in the hospital? Unless you're delivering a healthy baby or going to visit one, no one likes to be in the hospital. That's what I learned after working at Maine Med for almost five years. Um, you, you fall, you're in the hospital, you're often admitted. Following admission, you often have to go to rehab. This leads to all sorts of things. People tend to pick up germs and infections at the hospital or at rehab. It's isolating, the food stinks. Um, you're out of your normal routine. So it really affects people mentally and emotionally. That's one of the biggest things. Um, and the other thing is this, this horrible fear of falling again, yeah. um, which can lead people to be even more isolated um, because, oh, I don't want to leave the house. And I don't even mean on a snowy, icy day. I mean, not sure about going to church. That ramp is sturdy, but I'm not. You know, people get nervous. Um, so it tends to send people into a tailspin. And the big break that people tend to suffer is the hip. Uh, that's what happened to my Nana. She died at 99, and she was amazing. Um, she got remarried at 80. She retired at 80. She was just a real, she was great. Um, Grace Sullivan. Um, but after she broke her hip, everything changed. She couldn't really exercise anymore. I mean, she did her best, but it, it leads to other health issues. So. While we're on that, I'm not here to talk about this program, but if, has anybody taken a matter of balance? Okay, so that's an evidence-based program that actually has shown to reduce falling, to reduce fears of falling. Keep, it helps to keep people from being readmitted to the hospital. So if anybody's interested in that, I would call the number on the flyer that Lisa handed out because Southern Maine Agency on Aging, or SMA as we call it, has scheduled quite a few classes for the fall, including at Martins Point and Scarborough, which isn't that far. Um, so anyway, I, I would highly recommend it. Um, it's usually women, just like in this room, it's mostly women. Um, I always applaud men that show up at these things. Uh, women tend to be the primary care Givers, I feel like from womb to tomb, um, they they're always kind of helping others and also helping themselves. So um, that gives me something to look forward to. I feel like we're in good charge of ourselves. Um, but the class I'm here to talk about is is really special to me. Um, it's called Living Well for Better Health, and what it is is it's a chronic disease self-management class. So before we kind of get going with it, how many people in here, and before you raise your hand, has a chronic illness or a chronic condition? And I'm gonna just list a few. So hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, MS, chronic pain, hearing or visual issue, vision issues, um, anything. So, or who has had cancer or obesity, these are all considered chronic conditions. So how many people have at least one, and I'm including myself? And how many have more than one? Okay, so, and the older we get, it's, I think over age 65, the average person has two to five chronic conditions. 
And it's funny, because I'll be in a group like this and I'll say, oh, how many other people in here have a chronic condition and no one will raise their hand? And I'm like, okay, well, I'm 42 and I have two chronic illnesses and I know the average age in this room that I was in is about 87. I said, no one in here has any chronic conditions? And then, you know, we talked more about it, teased it out and realized we all did. So this class was designed to help people better manage whatever their condition was. And the reason I feel strongly about it is I've had type 1 diabetes. It'll be 33 years in October. So I was nine years old. Um, and you might see this thing that looks mm -hmm. like dental floss. That's my insulin pump. Um, I have another cool. thing on my stomach. Yeah, it's going to be tough getting it under my wedding dress, but it's fine. <laughs> I can't fit much more in there. Um, so, you know, I really get the challenges that come with having a chronic condition. Um, how frustrating it is to deal with doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. Maybe having a rude nurse, not to pick on nurses, but I've had them. Um, or even the front desk person at my doctor's office who the minute I walk in either makes me feel great or awful from their attitude. I mean, we deal with this stuff more, right, when we're in this situation. Um, multiple test results. Why isn't my doctor calling me back? Why are my prescriptions so expensive? Why isn't my insurance covering this? Or I forgot to take my medication. Or, oh, I'm traveling this weekend um, for the long holiday. Uh, what do I need in order to prepare for that? Or what does my spouse need? Because a lot of us are caring for someone with a chronic illness. Um, so we kind of, we talk about all those different things. Um, and one of the highlights of the class is something that we call action planning. And I want to give you a couple of examples um, of how that's helped people that have come through just my classes. I've probably taught 20 of them in the last two years. Um, for instance, I knew a woman who, when she started taking our class, she smoked two packs a day. That's a lot. And she was about 75 years old, and so this was a big habit for her. And it's a very tough one to break, as many people know. By the her action plan that we made every week, we all did, was to, you know, cut down on her smoking. And we wanted to make it realistic. So we don't say, I'm going to quit smoking in two weeks, or I'm going to lose 50 pounds in two weeks. That's not the action plan. That might be our goal. But the action plan is, I'm going to call the tobacco-free vein hotline. I'm going to get the little nicotine patch. I'm going to call my doctor. Or I'm going to start walking around the block. I'm going to replace my ice cream sundae after dinner with a banana with peanut butter. Things like that. And those are the things that lead to this woman who ended up only smoking two cigarettes a day by the end of our class. That's amazing. It's a six week class once a week. She went from 24 cigarettes a day to two. Um, I think that's amazing. Another woman who ended up taking our class twice, um, she had gone in for a doctor's appointment and she lost 30 pounds. And so it helped her with her mobility. She was able to walk uh, more comfortably. She could walk further. And her doctor said, how the heck did you lose this 30 pounds in six months? Because that's, I mean, that's a realistic goal, but that's tough. I couldn't do it um, if I had to. And her doc, she said, I took this class, and I started doing my action plan. I decided I'm going to walk a quarter mile a day, or I'm going to do this. She lost 30 pounds. It was a huge deal. Another good friend of mine, she's 86, took the class. Her goal, that was her goal, to walk a quarter. She was walking a quarter mile a day. She wanted to walk the full mile to Bug Light in South Portland. By the end of the six weeks, she was doing it three times a week. Um, so it's a little thing. My action plan was to lower my A1C. If anyone knows what that is, oh, do we? A lot of us probably know that. It's your average, glu average <coughs> glucose over three months. I wanted to lower mine from 7.3 to like 6.8. I ended up lowering it to 7.1. So I'm not there yet, but it motivated me to keep going. 
and I had, I mean, I've had diabetes for 33 years. I'm literally a pro at this. It's my, the average diabetic, they estimate, thinks about their diabetes at least three hours a day. I would argue it's 24 hours a day. Everything I do revolves around this disease, which is fine by me. That's what keeps me healthy. Um, but I had to make little plans, and, and a big one for me was, because I get bored at work, sometimes I'm not busy. I'm very high energy, I get things done quickly. So sometimes I'd be sitting at my desk, like on a dreadful conference call. Well, I knew that that bottom drawer had Cheez-Its, chocolate-covered peanuts, uh, you know, all my favorite snacks, and I would find that I would just eat them. And I would take my insulin, but it doesn't matter, I would still creep up. So my action plan for class was cut out carbs at work. Eat your breakfast, eat your lunch, have a snack or two, but get rid of the crap in your drawer. And I did. And, and I not only lost four pounds, but my A1C went down. I don't think I could have done it without the support of the class. Um, so those are those. That's, that's really it. But it's a... It's intended to help us literally live well with our chronic condition. Um, and we've gotten great feedback, and Lisa um, and I scheduled a class here to start on October 9th. That's a Tuesday. Tuesdays. Afternoon. One, yep, 1 to 3.30. Um, and I, I highly recommend it, but I do want to open up just five minutes for questions before I head out. Um, and if you don't have any, maybe Lisa could ask some program questions. Um, but please ask me anything, like about the class or, yeah. Oh, if you can't stay for the whole class, will it still help? Yes. All we ask is, because it's, it's two and a half hours with a 20 minute break, so we suggest you get up, walk around. <coughs> um, we have, I had a woman who did a yoga class on the morning that we had class in Yarmouth. She'd show up 45 minutes in. I saw her every week, but she was 45 minutes late. She was there, and it mattered to her. So I could be here for like maybe an hour. Yeah. Perfect. Pam is the crossing guard for the little children oh, at elementary school across the road. Oh, yeah. I love so that. So she has to be there by before 3, right? I have to be there at 2.30. 2.30. Yes, yes. which is so. much more important. Well, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, that's a whole but hour yes, and a half. To answer your up. question, yes. Um, and we do ask, it's, it's, you get the biggest bang for your buck if you can do four classes at least. So it's six classes. If you can make four, I feel that you get the benefits that you need. Um, the first and second class, you can't join after the second class um, only because it ends up being a kind of an intimate setting and, you know, people share stuff and we don't want just a newcomer coming in and it, it's, it's uncomfortable, yeah. you know, when you're talking about. Uh, and it's not, you're not going to teach it, it's, it's you it's, have some volunteer it's two people. two of my favorite coaches, um, Kim and Ginny. My last day at SMA is actually September 28th, um, so I'm really bummed. Our grant funding ended, so um, I'm going to be leaving. Uh, but yes, the two people that are teaching it are fantastic. And another thing, it's a self-management class, so we really encourage people, like I can't sit still. Um, so when I'm in any class, I get up, I walk around, I'll be in meetings at work at SMA, and they all look at me funny, but I'll get up and say, nope, I have to get my steps in, and I'll walk around the table and they laugh. You do what you have to do to be comfortable. If you cannot sit here for two hours, we do not want you to be uncomfortable. Um, so get up, leave, come back. And the two women that are teaching this class are, they're so compassionate, they're funny. They, they in fact, taught a class in Saco about in the wintertime. They still meet with the participants from that class once a month. They didn't want the class to end. I taught at South Portland Housing. Um, I had 16 people in my class. 10 of them, a year and a half later, still meet every month or two to report on their action plans and their goals, and it keeps them motivated. Mm -hmm. And I know this is a tight group, and I know this is an active group, and it's very clear. I mean, you're all very engaged and busy, and that's great. Um, 
And I wouldn't say that, the, and I hate when people say, well, I'm not that sick. Do I look sick? No. <laughs> I, I don't feel like I'm, I might be, but I don't look it. You know, I exercise every day, I eat well, I take care of my nieces and nephews. You can have a disease, you can be a healthy, sick person. So. Kind of, I've been thinking about it that it's kind of like, you know, we, at Christmas time we all start thinking about New Year's resolutions, little somethings you want to do, and, you know, how many hours into the new year do we stop doing those things we want to do? And this is the kind of, you know, this is going to be a, a group of people that are also wishing to change something or, and, and to support, you know, the whole takes a village, someone to talk to is a... Is a is a helpful thing when you have that kind of support around you. So, so that, that's all I have to say, but I, if anybody, um, I'm sorry if I went on, uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to call us at SMA or yeah, talk you have to, to Lisa. Talk to, you have to call, you, you can't register through me, you have to call the number on here, talk to Sue Adams to register okay. and, um, you know, I'll keep talking about it until it starts. Okay. Everything so if we, if more information we'll have. We have lots of flyers we'll have for people. I'll put one up if I get a bulletin board up. Great. So, so just call me, Lisa. If you have any questions, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Have Thank a you good, so much. Have a good meeting today. Oh, we're we're getting there. <laughs> His brothers thought he was a pretty funny little kid. everything to get the show business from soft shoe to ballroom dancing even a comedy team called two diamonds in the rough it wasn't until one night in newcastle pennsylvania forced to stand up alone in front of a mic the audience's reaction told him bob hope was a comedian Playing the circuit of small Midwest clubs, he spent three years honing his act until he made it work. On Broadway, he played opposite the leading ladies of the day. And he found his lifelong leading lady, a singer named Dolores Lee. Marvelous for words, the Testament shows, darling Bob Hope. The nation's new craze was his perfect showcase. His snappy timing and rapid fire patter became a Tuesday night habit. Bob Hope, ah, thank you so much. Bob Hope began his career in vaudeville in the 1920s. But he didn't become famous until he went on the radio in 1934 eventually became the host of The Pepsodent Show from 1938 to 1948. There he is with Jude Garland, 1939. This soon became the top radio show in the country and was one of the most listened to programs during World War II. During the 1930s, Hope juggled numerous show business jobs, acting in Broadway, hosting radio shows, traveling with the USO, and making movies. We think of Bob Hope as a comedian, but not many people realize he was a professional boxer and he could sing and dance as well. Now here's a clip of one of his earlier movies that shows off his singing voice. You do something to me, something that simply mystifies me. Tell me, why should it be? You have the power to hypnotize me. Let me live beneath your spell. Do, do that, do, do that you do so well. For you do something to me that nobody else could do. Kid during the Second World War, and uh, and 
have these really vivid memories of sitting by the radio and listening to Hope. Wednesday and the men and women in our armed forces. Tonight, Pepsodent brings to the patients of Tony General Hospital at Palm Springs, California, the Pepsodent Show starring Bob Hope and his special guest, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Morale is a tricky thing. It evaporates in the boredom of inactivity, but it expands in the hearts and minds of laughing servicemen. I know about that myself. When I was a young man about Cleveland with no Crosby to feed me gags, it wasn't so easy to get into trouble. We have to go out looking for excitement, something that wasn't nailed down. Of course, we never found any crown jewels in Cuyahoga County, but we did find trouble. That's what boredom did to us. The police are still wondering who stole those apples back in 1920. Seriously, the morale of this nation's Army, Navy, and Marine Corps is the problem of one lively lad multiplied by several million. You know, during the war, our boys in uniform were in every country in the world and on every ocean. They were in the hardest places to get to and in the biggest cities, keeping up their spirit was a tremendous job, which for more than five years, in large part, rested in the hands of a volunteer group, the USO. This organization was created by the six great welfare agencies, representing all faiths, and joined together for the first time in our history in a continuing effort for the nation's well-being. The United States government gave the USO the duty of serving the boys in our armed forces. To do this, the USO set up 3,000 clubs, lounges, mobile units, and other operations. At one time, more than 700 shows a day were being given in India, across two oceans, in France and Germany, from Alaska to Brazil, and from Newfoundland to the South Pacific. More than $200 million was contributed by the American public for this work, and has been spent in a business-like manner. The Army and the Navy, at the suggestion of General Eisenhower and Admiral Nimitz, backed by President Truman, have asked that this great service continue in order to help in the dangerous and difficult transition to final peace. The USO said, yes, we'll continue through 1947, but first we'll have to consult Mr. and Mrs. American public, show them what we've been doing, and ask for the money to finish the job. Imagine the scope of the USO. Here's our little gang down in the South Pacific. How do you like those outfits? That's better than wearing the regular pajamas. I don't want to give you the impression that I was the whole USO. They wouldn't let me. And the records show that there were 6,000 other camp show entertainers. And as for helping the boys and girls in the service, 1,500,000 volunteered in a thousand different ways to bring them a home away from home. No book can tell the whole story, neither can a few pictures. I can only ask you to imagine how our forces felt when a little bit of the United States was brought halfway around the world to them. They joked and laughed and rested. It made you feel good to see them. Probably a real good time to ask if either of you would share something about uh, your experience with the USO. So, Oh, you did? Okay. And when you were in the Army, you said? Yes. Okay. So he was working with the USO at the time, right. doing commercials like that. Wonderful. And you, ma'am? Uh, well, right after I graduated from high school, I was involved with a group that used to go downtown to Chicago to the USO uh, facility that they had to entertain troops mm -hmm. um, that were 
Uh, it was usually on a Sunday night, and this group, all of us, diff did different things. Some danced, some sang, I sang, and there were others that played instruments. But uh, we were young people's group, mm -hmm. and we entertained the, tr the troops that were in town. Terrific. Well, this is George Steinbeck, famous author. He was a war correspondent back in World War II. And this is what he wrote about Bob Hope. He said, when the time for recognition of service to the nation in wartime comes to be considered, Bob Hope should be high on the list. This man drives himself and is driven. It is impossible to see how he can do so much, can cover so much ground, can work so hard, and can be so effective. He works month after month at a pace that would kill most people. The program usually scheduled over many of these stations, The Art of Living, will not be heard at this time in order that the National Broadcasting Company may bring you Bob Hope in a special program from a naval hospital in the South Pacific. The Art of Living will be heard at its regular time next week. We now take you to the South Pacific. Yeah. From somewhere in the South Pacific, we present the Bob Hope Show. Long won an Academy Award that year for Best Original Song. Here are a few verses. It's pretty. Thanks. For the memory of faults that you forgave, rainbows on a way. And stockings in the basin when a fellow needs a shave. <laughs> I thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> for the memory. Of gardens at Versailles and beef and kidney pie. The night you worked and then came home with lipstick on your tie. <laughs> Lovely that much. Huh? For the memory of lingerie with lace. Yes, and pills nearby the case. <laughs> and how I jumped the day you trumped my one and only ace. How long? Lovely that was. We said goodbye with a highball. Then I got as high as a steeple. Did you? But we were intelligent people. No tears, no fuss. Hooray for us. Thank you. 
Thank you. Sequentially through it. In 1940, Bob teamed up with Bing Crosby and rode to Singapore the first of many road series movies. Enjoy the following scene. They had Waikiki wedding. Boy, they were slower than Crosby's horses compared to these Singapore sirens. Get a load of that. <clears throat> well, where were we? The hijinks continued in 1941 with Road to Zanzibar, then in 42 with Road to Morocco. For any villains we may meet, we haven't any fear. Paramount will protect us, cause we're side for five more years. <laughs> we sir, certainly do get around. Like a complete set of Shakespeare that you buy at the corner drugstore a $1.98. We're Morocco bound. Or like a volume of Omar Khayyam that you buy at the department store at Christmas time for your cousin Julia. We're Morocco time frame. Well, let's learn how Bob Hope and others entertain entertainers contributed to the war effort. We were affecting everyone, and everyone found his or her own way of helping the cause. For Hollywood stars, this meant enlisting, selling war bonds, appearing over armed forces radio, and entertaining the troops. Now it's going to be up to us to send to the men here and abroad real living entertainers songs, the dances, and the laughs they had back home. Our talent pool will be broken up into hundreds of units, traveling under the auspices of the USO camp shows and the special service division of the armed services. Where are the men in uniform of the entertainment? Show business has come to before and it will again. Yeah. And I told them that I would be willing to, to go and whatever the studio would allow me to go, give me time enough off. Well, the studio is very cooperative. All in all, I understand from the Treasury Department, I sold over $300 million in cash. Okay, Rob? Sing. Earn your dinner, baby. Humphrey Bogart. With a lot of bond drives, you people have proven by your magnificent response to each one of them that you know exactly why they were necessary. We've also had a lot of patriotic speeches. I'm sure you don't need another one from me to tell you why we need this victory loan. Now, why it's important that we make this victory loan the smashing climax of all bond drives. But what's more important is that we can all afford to buy those bonds. Let's all back the attack. Well, there is. Go and tell it. Well, Mr. Hope, uh, I haven't thanked you for everything yet, so if you're still selling kisses for $50 to work on, I'll take one, please. Well, there's just a few left. <laughs> oh, 
The Hollywood Canteen, operated between 1942 and 1945, is a club offering food, dancing, and entertainment for servicemen, usually on their way overseas. Everything in the canteen was free of charge. Marlene Dietrich and Rita Hayworth served food to soldiers at the Hollywood Canteen, November 17, 1942. If you've ever been to Hollywood, one thing you're sure to remember is this converted barn in the heart of the city. Here, under the leadership of Betty Davis and John Garfield, all the guilds and unions in Hollywood have collaborated in creating and maintaining the Hollywood Canteen. More than a million servicemen of the United Nations have been entertained here by almost everybody in motion pictures. Most of its earlier guests are scattered all over the world by now. The South Pacific, the Aleutians, the Middle East, ETO, Italy, well, let it go at all around the world. And to them, here's a message from one of the Canteen's favorites, Miss Dinah Shore. Hello, fellas. We had some guests of honor here the other night, convalescent men from an army hospital. And they seemed so darn glad to see the canteen again that we thought maybe you'd like to take a look. Especially you fellows who are so far away from home. So let's, let's look around. You'll be our honored guest tonight. Okay? You're greeted at the door by Lana Turner, Deanna Durbin, and Marlena Dietrich. And you grab yourself a partner for some music by Xavier Kruger. <laughs> Probably you'll find Judge and Mrs. Hardy behind the snack bar. That's Louis Stone and Faye Holden with Jenny Sims and Virginia Wiley. On stage, a song from Eddie Cannon. Her coffee would be sweeter, but I'm not in the dumps. Cause every time she hugs me, it's like two extra lumps. We're staying home tonight. While Hedy Lamar hands out autographs. <laughs> Fellas, many people from Hollywood are visiting the men at the front. But it isn't possible for all of us to get over there at once. So tonight I'd like to dedicate a song to some men who are fighting and sweating this war the hard way. The men of the China Burma India Theater of Operations. Here's some special lyrics to one of your favorite melodies. I'm singing this straight to you guys of CBI. <laughs> on the Armed Forces Radio Network to the troops overseas. Here's the sound. Command Performance USA, the greatest entertainers in America, is requested by you, the fighting men of the United States Armed Forces throughout the world. This weekly radio program is governed by your letters. Joe Jeep commands in the War Department of Bays. Anything from a song by Judy Garland to the sizzling sound of a sirloin steak. As this program is being performed in the Hollywood studio, a master recording is made from which transcripts will be shipped to Army and government-operated stations all over the world. Thank you. How do you feel it? This is Bob. This is Bob Command Performance Hope telling each Nazi that's in Russia today that Crimea doesn't pay. <laughs> Slept right in the barracks last night with the boys. You know what barracks are. That's 2,000 cots separated by individual crap games. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's hit the harmony trail to all APO and FPO numbers. For Fletch Alfie and Dooley, and for all of you everywhere, the girl who can defuse a blockbuster with one kiss, Miss Betty Hutt. <laughs> Are we living? I'm thinking only even him flat. He just dig, dig, and jump the old tick. 
Crosby made seven movies together from 1940 to 1962, which became known as the Road Movies. Of course, there they are. Bing Crosby explains. Just found a hole in my shoe and my stocking shows through. Ho, 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 ho. By 1940, with 24 films under his belt, Crosby's film career is at a crossroads. At 37, he does not possess the manic energy for screwball comedy, and though he can ride a horse better than any Western star, cowboy roles are not an option, nor were detective, husband, or father roles. It becomes difficult to know not only how to cast him, but who to cast him with. We had uh, Bob on last night, Bob Hope was on last night. And uh, when did you first meet Bob? Oh, where's how far I'm on the Friars Club in New York. I met him around there, shot some pool with him, and he rolled me pretty good. And uh, then uh, we worked at the Capitol Theater together. Did you ever catch his act? Uh, well, I stood in the wings and, uh, at once. Did he have a good act? No, it was awful. <laughs> I was a master of ceremonies, and Bing was a star. We were doing these shows, and it got a little boring, so we started ad-libbing together. And we worked out a routine. That was in 1932. Then 1937, I came out to Paramount, and Bing invited me down to Selmar, and we did the same routine that we did in the capital of New York. My father and I, we give our impression of two orchestra leaders meeting on the boulevard. Two orchestra leaders meeting on the boulevard. And the audience loved it. There was somebody there from Paramount. He went back to the studio and said, we got to put these guys together. The Road to Rio was made in 1947. Watch Bob and Big perform like the vaudevillians they were. We're full of glee, my body and me. We're happy all day through. You always see us laughing, hot like little boy. We're so full of joy. That's why we say to you, we're on our way. Of the team. Oh, 
sharp as broken glass. I was known as Harvard's toughest poop, the scourge of Boston Mass. Rock em, sock em, make em quit, hit em where they know they're hit. In the days gone by, they used to sign for the city fashion show. Now I wear coyote underwear, I use bullets to button my clothes, and tie my shoes with rattlesnake bows. Bullets for buttons and snakes for bows? Well, I'm so mean I hate myself. Oh. Give me eastern trimming where women are women in high silk holes and peekaboo clothes and French perfume that rots a room. You're all mine in buttons and bottles. I love coffee, I love tea, I love the girls and I love me. You're all mine in buttons and bottles. Never made the Harvard crew, won my letter in a canoe. You're all mine in buttons and bottles. Just a girl when I was ten, darned if I ain't ready again. You're all mine in buttons and bottles. When I was twelve, oh what a joy, mom told me I was a boy. You're all mine in buttons and bottles. After the dance, we parked in an alley. I wonder what's become of Sally. You're all mine in buttons and bottles. I'll have a great big smack if you give my bean bag back. You're all mine in buttons and bottles. You're a doll and I'm a dandy. Let's chip in for cotton candy. You're all mine in buttons and bottles. In 1952, Bob Hope also made another road movie with Bing. This one's called Road to Bally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Out of my way, who do you think you are? It's the toe of my boot, man, if you push too far. I hooked him on, this is the day I celebrate my birth. The self and son of a self and son of a son of a gun for birth. Who can play the drums? Is there a piper in the town? Have them put their kilts on and come right down. All ye brawny lads, whether you're poor or men of wealth, meet me in the tavern to drink my health. Who's that standing in my cask on clear? Uh, don't you know you're face to face with Robbie McMath? Oh, Robbie McMath, oh, hey, I hooked him on out of my way. Who do you think you are? It's the toe of my boot, to one if you push too far. I hooked him on, this is the day I celebrate my birth. The self and son of a self and son of a son of a gun from birth. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> What is it, McBaggers? Have you heard the latest about McTavish? What's he done now? He's living on the roof. Why would he be living on the roof? He heard someone say the drinks are on the house. <laughs> <laughs> the drinks are on the house. You don't. Let me. It's a little late, so good night, folks. S. MacArthur said, as he observed the amphibious assault from the sea at Incheon, Korea, September 15, 1950, the Navy and Marines have never shown more brightly than this morning. Camp Pendleton and its Marines would yet again shine brightly in the Korean War, despite the biting winter cold, fatigue and hunger, and a relentless enemy. So when the North Koreans invaded South Korea in 1950, the call went out for the reserves to mobilize and fill up the 1st Marine Division, and that's what happened. Uh, from all across America, reserves were mobilized. They marched down to the trains and the bus depots, or 
uh, and, and showed up here at Camp Pendleton to start forming uh, the first and the seventh lines. So Camp Pendleton forms the, the forming and staging base for the Marines that went to Korea. General MacArthur's idea was to pull out of Pusan and attack at halfway up the Korean Peninsula at the town of Incheon, which is just uh, to the west of Seoul, and then seize the capital. That was successful. So successful that Seoul was liberated within about two weeks. What happened next is they turned north to chase the North Koreans back into North Korea and went all the way to the Chinese border. The Chinese entered the war, and from there we enter the next phase, which is the, the famous Chosin campaign. In the last days of November, 1950, 12,000 men of the 1st Marine Division, along with a few thousand Army soldiers, found themselves trapped high in the mountains of North Korea, near a reservoir called Chosin. Their leaders had been caught off guard by the sudden entrance of the People's Republic of China into the five-month-old Korean War. The Americans were surrounded, outnumbered, and at risk of annihilation. The two-week battle that followed is among the most momentous in U.S. history. It helped set the course of American foreign policy in the Cold War and beyond, and it remains one of the most renowned in Marine Corps annals. In 1954, Mallard Monroe went to Korea to cheer up the troops. Here's an interview with someone who was there. What was the what was the, the reasoning of, of of the Marine Corps to actually get her out there for you? What, what, what well, we were we were part of the Eighth Army and the Tenth Corps, which had fought in Korea. In '54 was the waiting for the for the Greeks to come across the Indian River and would slaughter them. It was tedium and boredom in the outfits, and when winter comes, it's even more oppressive. And morale sort of flags. And then when we go see a Marilyn Monroe, our morale soared way up for weeks afterwards. Mm -hmm. So hopefully uh, what she got out of it, we also got something out of it. And I think it did spur her career to her benefit after Korea, to pump adrenaline into her career. As she came out of the uh, onto the stage. I want you to uh, describe the excitement and that roar one more time. And maybe if you don't want to say exactly the same thing you've said, maybe you <clears throat> talk to other people who had been there and you could use some words that they, how they described it. Give, 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 have another crack at that one. All right. When she come out, I'll try to bring in the remarks I heard. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, the loudest roar I ever heard. And <clears throat> Some of the fellows were saying, that's my girl, and all that, and boy, I never knew she was this beautiful. She was more beautiful than even on the screen, because we're up close, we're up close. And that cocktail dress, I don't know if she had her bra panties on, but to us it didn't look like she did. And she was making the moves, and we were responding tumultuously to each and one of them, and, and she, was a, she was a professional yeah. performer, and she knew how to Hold the crown. And I want you to also try one more time, um, and, and, and it's somewhat, you know, on, on a combat level, obviously, um, um, you can't call her heroic or anything, but to go out there for two hours in the freezing cold in that dress, um, you know, is somewhat heroic of itself. Put that one more time in your own words. Sure. As soon as we saw her come out with the, the upper power, you know, just skin exposed to the elements, we knew immediately she's a trooper, and she's putting on a real show, regardless of her, whatever house she was in. It meant a lot to us. She's spotting about this, and she's not holding back one iota. That that registered with us. Bob Hope hosted the Oscars 19 times from 1939 to 1977. Here's a tribute from Tom Hanks. Hey. Hey, everybody, how do you sum up an 80-year show business career in just a few sentences? Well, I gotta tell you, it's almost as difficult as trying to describe all the affection and respect 
and all the admiration and love we have for Mr. Bob Hope. I gotta tell you, uh, he was a radio star, Mr. Bob Hope was, a vaudeville legend, a giant on television, and certainly a hero to millions of our soldiers whom he visited overseas in war and peace over the decades. From 1939 to 1977, he hosted this very show a record 18 times. And I gotta tell you, we have so many memories to thank him for, and these are some of the best. To you bet your career. This is the night devoted to one man, Oscar, or as he's known around my house, the fugitive. Good evening and welcome to the real Star Wars, or as, as is known at my house, Passover. Marshal, what the rumor going around last year that I might run an Oscar, but nobody paid any attention to it, so I stopped spreading. Not only wasn't I nominated, on Hollywood Boulevard they just put a manhole cover over my star. Tonight we set aside petty differences, forget old feuds, and start new ones. I hope you losers aren't too disappointed. There's a bright side to all this. Remember, you can still run for governor. <laughs> fourth time here, I come here every year for my attack of indigestion. And I'm here again for my annual exercise and masochism. This is the 27th Annual Academy Awards. Welcome to the 47th Annual Academy Awards. I think they ought to give me an Oscar just for attendance, don't you? I didn't do the show last year. But didn't you watch it? A show without me? I want to tell you. I want to tell you. Well, I want to tell you. I love you. They all have their Oscars. But are they happy? <laughs> May I present you with the Oscar? This is an Oscar? I've never really wanted an Oscar. Although I guess they are reassuring to an actor who doesn't know how great he really is. more often than a burp in a wind tunnel. The third Marines have seen a lot of combat and they needed all their experience to find a place to sit on this hill. Here in Da Nang, it was strictly CRO, climbing room only. Look at these cats, they're lying with their bodies under the stage and their faces staring up at them. City. Yes, sir, Da Nang is one of my favorite stops, and I mean stop. Go any further, you're in Kong country. And the guys love it here because Da Nang has such a wonderful location. It's so handy to downtown Hanoi. And I want to tell you, folks, these Marines are really tough. I asked one guy if he'd seen... tougher than I thought. <laughs> They're really tough. I asked one guy if he'd seen John Wayne and he said, John Wayne, who's she? <laughs> and their motto is Semper Fidelis. That means, oh, don't worry about it, Doc. Just nail it back on. <laughs> That's some guys that never made it up there. Come on down. I don't think they're on our side, are they? <laughs> nice watch your book. <laughs> the Marines 
engineer would go over the hill if it wasn't for one thing. The Marines on the other side of the hill went over the hill to get over here. You can work that out. You're ready for Section 8. But these Marines have a great history. They've landed on more beaches than Frankie Avalon and Annette Fioricello. No, I go way back. I go way back with the Marines. Wake Island, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima. I saw all those pictures. In 1962, after an 11-year hiatus, Bob and Bing team up for one more last road movie, The Road to Hong Kong. Now, in this scene, Bob plays the straight man to Peter Sellers. So Harry Turner desperately tried to regain his friend's memory. He took him to the most highly respected neurologist in India. Oh, Curry in my conflict, you understand? One moment, please. Smart to myself, I'll be in front of you, gentlemen. <laughs> no, dear. Come to the examination. Please take in that out of the way. Now, one second. Looking in here? My goodness gracious me. But would you look in the other ear, please? Well, I can see you. <laughs> Strange, I can see you. That's only since I put in air conditioning. What do I look like? You look like you need a doctor. I don't know where I can find a doctor at this time of the day. Doctor, will you please get on with the examination? No, but I tell you what I will do. What? I'll get on with my examination. Now, first of all, the most important point at this stage of the proceeding is the matter of the fee. Since you are fine, American gentleman, I am offering you my special European fee, 1,200 rupees. 1,200 rupees? Please, right. Open your mouth, please, and say, Klein Weibus, King Gifford, Gerrit, Windrock, with Klein, the city of Ah, you are suffering from a severe attack of teeth and two cavities. I will fill them for you for 600 rupees. Are you a doctor or a dentist? What do you need? I need to get my memory back. Yes, I know. Could you use some uh, French postcards? No. No? Please. Slightly used Havana cigar? No. Oh. Uh, underwater inflatable bust of Yogi Berra? No. Please, it's going for a song. Thank you very much for the number, please. And I'm the patient, that's what I thought. Come on, Doc, we want to get this fellow's memory back. Now, will you get on with the therapy? No, my dear fellow, but I tell you when I will. But I'll get on with the therapy. First of all, we have the special All India close-up eye test reading chart. Now, read please from the fourth line down. Thank you very much. I owe you... 1,300 rupees? 1,300? A minute ago it was 1,200. You should have jumped at it when you had the chance, my dear fellow. Doctor, there's nothing wrong with my eyes. No, as a matter of fact, you've got very beautiful eyes. Never mind. <coughs> I'll tell you what I will do. I will start the special long-distance eye test now. Where's the sausages in here? Oh, I'm so sorry. It's my mother. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it is. Here, I'm giving you the eye test that is specially constructed for American gentlemen visiting our beautiful country. No, it is. Fort Wendelsey. Fort Line Down. Read it, please. Yeah, but that's Indian. I can't read Indian. No, I'll read it for you. No, better still, I'll play it for you. No. Wait a minute. I'll try it. Ooh, just a second. Damn old flies, they get everywhere, you know.
you know, I tell you, these guys have been receiving you so great, and I don't blame them, I'll tell you that. If there were, was ever a walking definition of ship shape, you're it. Thank you, Bob. Does that mean you like my port and starboard? Not to mention your bow and your stern. And I can understand that you look beautiful. Oh, thank you, Bob. You know, it, it takes a bit of effort. It's not easy finding a mirror in the middle of the Persian Gulf that you're not using. Bob, you know, there, there, I can't think of anything I'd rather do than spend the holidays with a handsome man, a sexy man, a gorgeous man. Yeah, and I am. Him? Him, 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 him. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> she doesn't have a picture, doesn't she? Marie Osmond joined Bob Hope, also in the Persian Gulf, for some USO shows. This next song has become so popular that it's almost a national anthem. And I can understand why. It sums up the way we all feel about this great land of ours. As Brie Osmond sings, God bless the USA, feel free to join right in. After all, being an American really is something to be proud of. Here she is. crisis will always be remembered. I just want you boys to see what you're fighting for, that's all. Say, Bob, am I standing in the right place? <laughs> Don't worry, honey, if you're not, they'll move the base. I don't know what I'm doing here, Bob. I can't sing and I can't dance. No, I'll just stand there. They'll do the singing and dancing. All right. I don't know what you guys did to get here, but let that be a lesson to you. brought a little bit of home 10,000 miles away and especially at Christmas time. Is uh, Specialist Fourth Brian H. O'Connell here? Where is he? Would you come up please? I went over to Vietnam approximately in June or July of 65. My wife was about six months pregnant. Just before we got on the plane, his wife brought this over to us. And here's a picture of twins, his twins that he's never seen. I had no idea what they looked like. I just knew that uh, they were twin boys. And I just 
wants you to take a peek at these little kids as the first time he's ever seen them. Those My dad didn't like to talk about Vietnam much from his personal experiences. But one thing dad did talk about from the war was the receiving the picture on stage with Bob Hope. Right. When Bob gave me the, the brag book, I was proud, really proud of him, you know, and I thought it was great. I appreciate it very much. You know, it's a great feeling. Big bang, I saw the whole game. I think one of the most emotional shows I ever played was when I played for the 1st Marine Division in Pavuvu down in the South Pacific because uh, we were playing an island called Banika and this fellow flew over and said, could you possibly do an extra show for the 1st Marine Division? They've never had a show and they would really love to see and they're going to invade Peleliu. And so we flew over the next morning and you knew when you walked out there that you're playing for 15,000 kids, that a lot of those guys you never see again. And as it worked out, 60% of those kids were knocked off in this invasion of Peleliu. Have a Merry Christmas and God bless you. Bye. So joyous and, you know, we laugh till we cry. There are these guys who are going to go, maybe so, a number of them are going to go die. We're all laughing together. That's a real service. In a lot of ways, that's probably the last performance of any of those guys saw. In that regard, that speaks volumes about the man. Bob Hope is one of a kind. He's a saint, and if he isn't, he should be. God bless Bob Hope.